When I was a child, I used to ask my mother where I was before I was born. I was far more interested in this than what happened after we died. And this was at least likely in part because I was the very, very youngest child in our family. So there existed just years and years of photographs in which I did not exist yet. Where was I? I wanted to know. How did I come to be? And like every parent ever, she told me a story. This story, of course, was not true. They never really are. But it felt true to her. This story about how she had met my dad after the death of his first wife, when he was a very young man still and had three very young kids, and how she had fallen head over heels in love with him when they met at a bar. And then that they had tried to have a baby for several years, and then by the time I came along, it was really kind of the end of their marriage. And of course, there was grief there for her, right, to leave these three children she'd helped raise. And the interesting part, of course, for me, was this had all happened before my time, before I had consciousness. And the other side of the story was completely different, and I mean completely different, right? I have these three much older siblings, and they would tell me these horror stories of their stepmother, right? My mother, <laughs> who made them bring their lunch to school in those gigantic paper grocery bags, which she did for me too, so I knew this to be true. And how she never could quite replace their mother, right? It was this this duality of how hard she'd tried versus how much she'd failed. And neither of these stories is true. Our memories are just not very good. And we basically tell stories based on how it felt to us, more than on facts anyway. And so each of us, myself very much included, carries around multiple origin stories within us, both personal and then, of course, collective as well. And each of them tells some piece of the truth, but never more than that. We are always and forever telling each other stories of where we come from and who we are. Because it's the deepest, it's one of our deepest questions. And so there are all of these myths around where we come from. And I think one of the most known to this culture is that of Adam and Eve, right? So granted a garden of infinite beauty and abundance, two earthlings lived in relative comfort and ignorant bliss. Their every need was taken care of, their life was one of ease. And they were asked to follow just one rule, right? <coughs> Don't eat from the tree of knowledge or from the tree of eternal life. But curiosity got the better of them, and they chose to taste of the fruit of knowledge. And once they had awareness, they could no longer go back to their previous way of life, naive and uncomplicated by truth as it had been. No, 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 they had to go through this horrible period of transition and growing pains to become what it was they were meant to be. And I think that there are many, many people in many religions that take this story as the fall of humanity, that through this act of defiance, we pulled ourselves away from divine love, right? Our lives now a punishment for that disobedience. But there are many ways to read that story. And I take it a very different sort of way. My take is that this choice of these earthlings to experience knowledge was actually the rise of humanity and not the fall, right? This is an origin story of the necessary development that we go through into adulthood. Until their moment of enlightenment, Adam and Eve were not fully human, for they did not have the key element that makes us human, self-awareness. And it's the pain of knowing that brings us closer to the divine, 
allowing us to make decisions about how we live our lives with intention and intelligence. In that moment of knowledge, Eve was named the mother creator, and her identity was forever changed. And through her bold actions, humanity was born. So this one myth, which is actually two, told in quick succession, has been used in a multitude of ways, interpreted to mean a lot of different things. That women came from men, were therefore inferior. That humans hold supreme authority over the land and its animals, right? That humans were born flawed or sinful, and that God is vengeful and punishes disobedience. All of these stories we tell about ourselves shape who we are and how we act. These various symbols that we allow ourselves to use, God the Father, Earth Mother, Wise Teacher, Universe, Great Mystery, they each have different messages about who is powerful and what is sacred. So the story I told the children of Sky Woman is a pretty different origin story from the one that we were taught in the Judeo-Christian background, right? I've heard this story told a couple of different times, one by Thomas King in that same book. Um, and this version that I told the children was from Braiding Sweetgrass, which is another novel. And each of them has a few things in common. In each of them, Sky Woman falls to earth and is aided by the animals. And it's clear that without the animals, she would have died. And in each version of this creation myth, the world is co-created by animals and humans alike, each caring for the other, each ensuring the other's survival. In this myth, humans and animals are not different. They're not on different playing fields. In fact, in some of them, the animals all wonder if she's ever going to really figure out how to live on the earth. This myth tells a very different story, I think, about who we are as human beings and what role we play in the planet, right? So it speaks of co-creation, of collaboration, of humility, and of humor. And then there's, there's the myth that I think most of us in this room might be the most mm, inclined to call our own myth, which is that which is put forth currently by the scientific community, right? So we've got the Big Bang Theory, and we've got evolution. The universe slowly expanding and gathering together through gravitational forces and planets swirling in orbit. Primordial ooze creating warm spaces enough for life to begin. And from there, an underwater world of plants and amoeba turning into fish and amphibians and reptiles and dinosaurs, and then a great comet that wipes out most of the Earth and sets off a brand new chain of events that leads eventually to apes, right, to Homo erectus, and then to Homo sapiens. My husband, who is a biochemist, assures me that this too is more myth than absolute fact. Scientists are telling a story, the best one they possibly know how to tell right now, mind you. But this is still a lens that we view the world through, right? And it still has its own weird biases, right? Like, for instance, we sort of see evolution as kind of ending with us. It's like, we're done. All done now. The best ever ape ever. Humans, right? And we lack a little bit of humility because we think of ourselves as this ultimate great ape. Like, we did it. We evolved. We're done. And this story about evolution is always focused on us. It always gets us to us because we're the one telling the story, right? So years ago, in the winter I now call my spiritual reawakening winter, I went to a show at the Chicago Theater. It was put on by Radiolab. Does anyone know what Radiolab is? It's like a, now they do a podcast too, and yeah, they're great, and they talk about all sorts of things. But this show was called In the Dark, and it turned out that it was about the evolution 
of the eye. So they began the show by turning off all of the lights and talking about how in the beginning of life on Earth, when the first cells began to replicate, organisms formed and developed and learned ways to locate food and find warmth and replicate faster. But no one, nothing on the Earth had eyes, right? So no one could see that there was a sun making all of this warmth happen. They had no idea like what was causing that to happen. And it's hard to imagine that literally nothing could see this light. And I do not know why this was the moment in time in my life when everything changed, but it was. I was like, oh. <laughs> Theologically speaking, it was the moment when I realized I didn't know everything yet, and that in fact none of us knew everything yet, right? That there might be something out there, as real as the sun, <laughs> and we don't have the senses to see it, right? Now, this doesn't mean it's supernatural. It means it could be completely natural what this thing is that we can't sense yet, but we feel more indirectly, right, and that we maybe would name as something like God now. So I think that was the moment, right? That was the moment when I went, oh, no. Now I have to rethink everything. I have to acknowledge that being human essentially means living into the mystery and into the gaps. Right, and that was when my religious life really came back to life for me. And all of these origin stories tell us different things about who we are as human beings and how we relate to nature and to other communities. And none of them is exactly true, but the choice of which we believe and which we take on, that does matter to how we live our lives, right? Because if I hold as most important that we are exceptional beings, separated out from all the rest of animals and nature, it is much easier for me to justify drilling for oil or burning a hundred acres of rainforest so that I can have cow land, right? Because I am the most important thing. My family is the most important thing. But if instead I believe to my very core that I am no more important than the oak tree or the pig, and I'm definitely not more important than the people who live across the street from me, well, then my actions have to change, right? I have to act differently. I have to live differently. And I think we're in a moment, to say the very least, in our country right now, where fractions and divisions, we as a nation are incredibly confused about who we are, the story that we are telling ourselves about who we, where we came from, right? And where we ought to be going. Part of my own origin story is that I was raised Unitarian Universalist, right? And so I grew up thinking I knew what that meant. I knew what that meant. It meant we didn't believe in God. That's what that meant, because that's where I was raised, right? It took me going to a bunch of different Unitarian Universalist churches to realize there's as many stories about what you youism is as there are people in Unitarian Universalism, right? We all have our own stories about what this tradition means. And this tra faith tradition was founded on some of the same stories that this country was founded on, right? Individualism, freedom, achievement, building, expansion, right? And we inherited all of the same systemic problems that comes with those moral values, right? Systemic racism, classism, colonialism, and a hyper focus on the self. Part of our work, all of our work, but potentially those who identify as white more so, is to become aware of these origin stories and how potentially impactful they are on how we act and how we see ourselves in a community, right? So I wanna leave you with three simple ideas about how you might begin to unpack some of the stories 
that you've just been living in, right? Like the water you've been swimming in. And these can be applied to yourself, your family, your faith community, maybe even your country. But as with all things, it's best to just start with yourself. So the first step is to notice the stories that you have told yourself over and over again. Notice the stories that are told to you over and over again. Start to observe what those stories tell you about who you are and who you are in a community. Because once we can see the stories, we can make decisions, right? We can make decisions about whether or not we want to keep that one or add to it, or chuck it out and add a different one in instead, right? And it is possible to write or rewrite your own origin stories, right? So I'm teaching an online class right now and one of the exercises that we do is to simply name our own demographics. How old am I? What generation does that make me? What is my race? What is my class background, right? And what did those things mean about who I am now growing up? Because we, we just think of them as normal when they're ours, right? But they're not. They are yours. They are your origin story. So if you can start naming these pieces for yourself, start creating your own myth of who you are and who you want to become, you get to make more choices. So the second step is to see the ecosystem, right, in which you were told these stories. So I remember I was once sitting in a meeting at a church, much like this one, and one of the board members like stood up and said, when are we ever going to get young adults in leadership? And I looked around and I saw three young adults in that room. There were three right there, but he did not see them, right? He was repeating the story that church had been telling about themselves for years, that there was no young adults. Where are the young adults? There's no young adults in leadership. And he hadn't updated that story with the facts of the people right in front of him. Last year, I served a church that had a different problem. <laughs> they had these gigantic plaques that sit opposite the pulpit. And these plaques had scriptures all sort of jumbled together, um, none of which really held to either Unitarian or Universalist values whatsoever. And everyone was really bothered by them because new people would come in and go, what's with this plaque? Like, these don't really seem to represent what you say you are. But the historical committee was like, no, you can't move them. They've been here forever, right? That's the way that they thought. Now that's not necessarily wrong, right? But it's just a matter of when is history beginning for that church, right? History began for them in their brains in 1846 or whenever those plaques went up. But there was a whole history of that land and people before those plaques. So they can make many decisions about whether or not they want to keep them up. I'm not making judgments about it. It's just a story. The story they told was that these were very important to the history of the church, right? I'm sure there are things like that here. We all deal with these things in church. And so the third step, after you've figured out your own stories, the stories your community tells, is to start reading the stories of people who are not like you. It sounds simple, but fiction in particular is how we make meaning in our lives. We're built that way, humans. So if you start reading fiction written by people who don't look like you and by people who were raised in different environments than you, then you can really start to see your own stories for what they are, a story, right? So if you choose the stories that you're going to retell, right, more consciously, that creates a better guide map Right, that's all I'm looking for you to do, is just create a little bit more of a guide map for who you actually want to be and what you want to say about who you are. And what I would like, if I could have my way, is that our country would start telling more stories, more diverse stories, right? So that the narratives of this country would begin to reflect the multiplicity and the diversity of this amazing land that we do in fact call home. So may we see and hear these stories as a way forward. 
because the truth about stories is that's all we are. So we need to choose them with care. Blessed be.